Hi everyone, uh, my name is Shafali Jeste. I'm a pediatric neurologist here at UCLA and I'm an associate professor in psychiatry, pediatrics, and neurology in the David Geffen School of Medicine um, and I'm lucky to be one of the lead investigators in our UCLA Center for Autism Research and Treatment. So UCLA actually has one of the largest and most multidisciplinary autism centers in the world. And my goal today in the next like 25 to 30 minutes, hopefully a little bit less, is I'm going to give you kind of a good overview of autism. And I, I titled the talk Mythbusters because there is a lot that's sort of misunderstood or unknown about autism. And I would like to kind of um, dispel some of the myths that we have about autism from, this, from diagnosis all the way to treatment and also give you a good overview of how we kind of understand autism from a clinical and research standpoint. Hopefully this will be the first of many um, you know, webinars that we can provide for you through our Autism Center on some of the excellence that we have in both clinical and research um, uh, work in autism at UCLA. So we're going to get started. Um, and as I said, my talk is called Autism Disorders, um, Autism Spectrum Disorders Mythbusters. And you can ask questions through social media, um, these are just my financial disclosures, none of which impact what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, what I'm going to do today is give you, again, just a quick um, uh, review of some basic themes in autism. We're going to talk about diagnosis and epidemiology. We'll talk a little bit about neurobiology and then finish with treatment. And then I'm happy to take questions. So I first just want to highlight, and I, this is what I mentioned earlier, that we have this very, very rich multidisciplinary autism center here at UCLA called CART, the Center for Autism Research and Treatment. And CART has actually three arms, if you will. There's a big research arm that's largely focused on um, integrating biology and neuroscience with treatment, right? So we use a lot of our knowledge about what happens in the brain in autism to help inform not just diagnostics, but hopefully improving outcomes in these, in these children. And there's lots of studies that um, your children can get involved in that I can give you some links to at the end. We also have a big clinical program that provides consultation, both from a medical standpoint and also evaluations for diagnostics and treatment recommendations. And that clinic is called the Child and Adult Neurodevelopmental Clinic. And then finally, we actually um, collaborate quite a bit with many intervention programs at UCLA. And I'll highlight two in particular, the Early Childhood Partial Hospitalization Program, which is an early intervention program in the Semmel Institute for Children with Autism, as well as PEERS, which is a social skills training for adolescents with autism. And there's actually now a preschool PEERS as well. So lots of opportunities to get involved um, here at UCLA from the standpoint of autism. So I always like starting with kind of a historical context. I think it puts things in perspective a little bit. So what's interesting is the term autism was actually coined in 1910 by Eugene Bloiler, who was a clinician who really took care of individuals with schizophrenia. And he used the term autism to describe kind of this withdrawal from the social fabric of the world that many individuals with schizophrenia demonstrated. Um, it wasn't actually described as a unique clinical syndrome in children until Leo Connor in 1943, who wrote this beautiful manuscript called The Autistic Disturbance of Affective Contact. And he described a group of children who demonstrated challenges in social interaction as well as communication and had some repetitive behaviors, which we'll talk about. Um, interestingly, in the same year, Hans Asperger, in another part of the world, actually over in Europe, actually described a similar, actually, semiology, a group of children who uh, had also some limitations in their social interaction and communication skills, and that paper was called Autistic Psychopathy in Childhood. The difference in Asperger's account was that he described children who had fairly high cognitive abilities and language abilities, and actually that description was what ultimately led to the coining of the term Asperger's syndrome or Asperger's disorder. Um, however, despite all these early descriptions, it wasn't until 1980 that autism was actually recognized as a clinical disorder or syndrome um, or condition in DSM-3. And DSM is our Diagnostic Statistics Manual. It's a big book that describes all of the different neurobehavioral psychiatric conditions that we um, diagnose and treat in neurology and psychiatry. So since the time in 1980 when we started recognizing it as a clinical syndrome, as I'm sure many of you know, the prevalence has really increased with our increased awareness. And our prevalence monitoring is done through the Centers of Disease Control, and I just highlight the most recent summary of this, which was published in 2014, which um, estimated rates of autism based on querying 11 sites around the country. Right, so the way these prevalence rates are estimated is they look at diagnostic evaluations that have already been performed in 
different sites. So they're not actually going in and prospectively testing children for autism. And what was found in that report was that one in 68 children nationwide met criteria for autism with a four to one male to female ratio. So it is more common in boys like many neurodevelopmental disorders. So the question I always get asked, the first question is why the increase, right? And this is where myth number one is going to hopefully start to get busted. But the real reason actually is very pragmatic. It's that we're diagnosing it more. So we're very much aware of autism. We look for signs earlier in development, which we'll talk about. And so in that context, we actually are diagnosing more and more children with autism. This graph actually is just one example of kind of how the diagnostic practices are affecting prevalence. So this is actually school records. This is a very large study that was done on an international registry. And it was actually looking at in um, the IEP or the individualized education program that children have in schools, what was their primary diagnosis. And what you find is that this is by age, is that over time, in it, by age, as the diagnosis of intellectual disability is going down, this is the change in diagnostic practice, the rate of autism is going up. So what's happening is a lot of children who used to be considered intellectually disabled or having learning disabilities, people are not recognizing this might be autism, and the diagnosis is being shifted to that, right? So that's just an example of how our diagnostic practices can actually change rates of prevalence. But of course there's other factors as well, and there's a lot of research being done in the possibility of environmental factors. The ones that we know about um, are ones that, you know, I, I, I use the term environmental, but what I mean by that is just uh, causes that are not genetic. They're not purely biological, if you will. And those, the ones that have been well shown to be uh, related to a diagnosis of autism are parental age. So advanced parental age, older parents, both moms and dads, um, confer a higher risk for autism. And that's partly because of the higher likelihood of genetic variation happening in older parents. And we'll talk about that in the neurobiology section. Um, and then other dr uh, exposures to the developing fetus, things like maternal drug exposure um, or other even medication use at times has been implicated, um, extreme prematurity or any other sort of insults that happen to the baby early on in development. Of course, there's a lot of interest in other exposures, things like environmental um, exposures like pesticides and other toxins. And I will just say that there have been no definitive environmental exposures that have been shown to cause autism. And that actually includes the vaccines. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this today in this talk, but I will say that there is a huge belief um, unfortunately, that was started by a paper that was then really disreputed about 20 years ago that implicated the vaccines in autism. And we have done many, many, many large studies, large scale studies, looking at populations that had vaccine administration programs and then lost them and examined rates of autism. And it's really been shown quite consistently that, that we do not think vaccines cause autism. And again, I'm happy to take more questions on that later. Okay, so we're gonna talk about diagnosis now, right? So how do we diagnose autism? Well, it's really based on a list of symptoms, and we actually use this book, the, as I mentioned, the DSM. The newest one is the DSM-5, and the diagnostic criteria are based on a, a group of experts coming together and really thinking about what symptoms consistently hang together in children who we think have autism, right? Um, autism sits in the chapter of neurodevelopmental disorders. These are conditions that emerge early in development and affect development, but obviously can be very dynamic because development is very dynamic. And the other conditions in that chapter include intellectual disability, global delay, ADHD, and a new diagnosis, which we won't talk about today, called social communication disorder. So specifically with autism, to meet criteria for autism, you need to meet two sets of criteria. One is impairment in social communication skills. And the second is the presence of repetitive behaviors and restricted interests. And then when we think about level of severity or the level of challenge a child has, we base that largely on their language ability and how much support they need day to day. How much support do they need in school? How much support do they need in their daily living skills? Um, to parse these out a little bit in more detail, and again, we won't go into this in too, too much detail. Again, it's a list of symptoms, right? So under the social communication domain, we look for um, challenges in social emotional reciprocity, so back and forth. Um, problems in nonverbal communicative behaviors, things like pointing, gesturing, eye contact. And then finally, difficulties in developing and maintaining relationships. This is language straight out of the DSM. So I'm just verbatim using those, th this language here. It's not what I have written. 
Um, and then in the repetitive behavior restricted interest domain, it's repetitive motor mannerisms, and that includes repetitive speech, like reciting parts of a song or parts of something a child sees on TV over and over again, insistence on sameness, so having a real challenge with, routine, with routines being broken, right, so inflexibility. And that also ties into having fixated interests, so children may be very focused on a certain topic like dinosaurs or Star Wars and have a lot of trouble generalizing their discussion items or interest to other topics. And then finally is this kind of new addition, which is sensory issues, so hyper or hyporeactivity to sensory input. So examples of that include being hypersensitive to sounds or smells or certain textures and not even being able to wear certain clothes, for instance, because of the texture of the cloth. Right, that's an example. Or some parents will actually report hyposensitivity. So they'll say, my child doesn't seem like he or she feels pain. That he might or, you know, have their hand in an ice bucket and not even feel cold, that sort of thing. And that can, as you can imagine, can cause some problems if it's actually you know, causing um, harm to the child um, if they're not feeling uh, the pain or, or acting on it. So, you know, many of you probably have sort of thought about autism in its older formulation, autism spectrum disorder, which was in the DSM-4, the manual before the DSM-5, and there were some big changes, and I want to bring those up, even though it's been a couple of years since the DSM-5, because again, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around the way we diagnose autism and the labels we use. Um, so one is that it used to be that language and social skills were separate domains in the DSM-4, and they've been combined, as I showed you. And the reason that's important is that, as you can imagine, there are children who have lots of language. They can speak many, many words, and their verbal IQ scores might be quite high, but if they don't use the language in a socially appropriate way, meaning they don't use it to communicate with others, it's still a problem. It still causes problems with social interaction. So it was recognized by the DSM-5 committee that language on its own is not the issue. It's how it's used socially, right? The other thing that combining those domains opens up is the ability to look for signs of autism in much younger children, right? So a, a 12-month-old or an 18-month-old may not actually have a lot of words, but if they're not using gestures or eye contact to communicate, we might start thinking that's a red flag. The other change is that, the, that rather than having specific labels as there used to be in the DSM-4, which some of you may know about, like autistic disorder or Asperger's or PDD-NOS, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, that's a mouthful, um, it's recognized that all of these fall into just one spectrum. So now when we give a child a diagnosis, we say autism spectrum disorder. We don't use these labels. And in fact, Asperger's is not considered a clinical diagnosis any, anymore. Sensory impairment became part of the diagnostic criteria. Again, that's new. Um, another important change was that it used to be that you couldn't actually diagnose ADHD, attention deficit, in a child with autism, which led to some issues from the standpoint of even uh, providing children with accurate diagnostic labels for interventions, right? And now we recognize they overlap so much that they actually should be diagnosed together. And then finally and importantly, there's no minimum age of onset of symptoms or maximum age. So we can diagnose children as young as 18 months to two, although we really think the diagnosis is most stable by age three. But we also can diagnose adults. And it used to be thought that we couldn't. And so these, this list here gets at, hopefully busts a few kind of myths, if you will, in autism. One is that Asperger's disorder is a distinct syndrome. We actually don't really think it is anymore. Uh, the other myth is that ADHD cannot co-occur with autism. That's something that parents are often told, also not true. And finally, there's also been, I think, a myth in the field for a long time that you cannot diagnose autism in an adult because it's a developmental condition. But we know now that we can, and often it is that the, child, the adult had symptoms in childhood. They just weren't recognized at that time. Okay, and I'm not going to spend too much time here. I'm just going to say that we also recognize there's a lot of heterogeneity or variability in autism, and a tremendous amount of research is being done on understanding why. Why is there so much variability? And we'll get to that a little bit in the next section, but I'll say that the places that we really see quite a bit of variability is in, in cognitive function and language. So a third of children with autism never gain language but uh, there's another subset of children who have quite a bit of language, right? And you can imagine the types of interventions that we need for these children will vary based on their needs. Okay, so I'm gonna now move on to talk a little bit about neurobiology, and this is actually where we have quite a bit of focus of our work being done at UCLA, is on kind of understanding the neurobiology of autism. I'm gonna breeze through in about 
five minutes to talk to you about kind of give you a glimpse of what we're doing and hopefully we can talk in more detail in future presentations. Uh, when we think about the neurobiology of autism, we actually have to first think about genetics because it's really paved the way for our understanding of brain development in autism. And what we know is that autism is quite heritable. What does that mean? Well, we know that in twin studies, for instance, that having identical twins, one if one has autism, the likelihood of the other having autism is very high. It's not 100%, but it's about 70%. But we also know that there's a high recurrence rate in siblings. So if you have a child with autism, the chance of a second child meeting criteria for autism is 10 to 15%. And as I'll mention in a minute, we leverage that risk actually to be able to study these infants who are siblings because they're higher risk. And we can actually try to study them from a very early age to identify the earliest signs of developmental delay or autism, obviously, so that we can start interventions. Um, if you have more than one child with autism, then the chance of having a third child with autism goes up even more, right? So we know there's some heritability here, and this graph just really shows the probability of having a child with autism if you have a sibling, have a sibling versus not having a sibling. Okay, so based on the knowledge that there is heritability in autism, many researchers around the world over the last two decades really, you know, banded together and said, let's start thinking about what are the genes? What are the genes that are important? What are the, what's the genetic makeup that uh, predisposes individuals to autism? And what I'll say is that the technology and our methods to study Autism genetics and frankly genetics of any condition have really, the technology has exploded over the last 15 years. We used to start with what some of you may be familiar with, which is just the karyotype, which is where you can sort of take a, as I like to think of it, a 10,000 foot view of your chromosomes and you can see if there's a big, a big piece missing or, or an extra piece or if you have an entirely extra chromosome like we see with Down syndrome, right, which is trisomy 21. That led then to sort of more advanced technology where we can examine pieces of the chromosome that might be missing or duplicated. And that technology is called the chromosomal microarray. And what we gain from, what we gather from that are what we call copy number variants. So meaning are there extra copies or not enough copies of certain segments of the chromosome. And then more recently, the technology has advanced to being able to identify single, single genes, single actually base pairs in your, your genetic makeup. So if you think of the alphabet of, the, of your DNA, if one letter is off, we can identify that with whole exome sequencing. And that allows us to look at individual genes, not even whole chunks of, of DNA. And what that technology has led to has been pretty extraordinary. What we have actually found is that almost half of all of autism is accounted for by some genetic variation. It doesn't always mean one gene or one set of genes. It might be multiple genes together, which of course gets more complicated in terms of diagnostics. But from the purposes, from a clinical standpoint, what's important to know is that through all this testing, what we've been able to do is start to identify specific genetic causes and specific genetic syndromes that confer a very high risk for autism and which we can actually study and try to understand as um, important clinical entities okay, within the spectrum. What that science has also led to from a clinical standpoint is a complete revamping of our clinical recommendations. So now, the, the only routinely recommended medical workup for every child with autism is genetic testing. Okay, and this is a schematic from, that's, that we uh, modified from the recommendations that were published in 2013, and I'll just summarize them, which is that every child with an autism diagnosis should undergo some basic genetic counseling even from a specialty provider like a neurologist. It doesn't have to be a genetic counselor, although that's always the best. And then boys should have testing for Fragile X. Girls should have testing for Rett syndrome, which is one of the genetic variants associated with autism. And all children should undergo that microarray test that I mentioned, because that microarray test is identifying variation in at least 20% of children. Okay, so again, we can, the details don't matter quite as much as, as to really emphasize that this is, our science has moved clinical practice, okay? And I, it also sort of dispels a myth that often families are, you know, told or, or believe and often come to me and we have discussions about this, which is that it is not true that every child with autism needs 
pan scanning, right? Every child does not routinely require an EEG, an MRI, metabolic testing, all these things. Every child should undergo genetic testing. And I will say from just a practical standpoint, insurance companies have caught up a bit with this recommendation and most insurances will cover at least the microarray. And we do, we work very hard at UCLA to try to help families get those tests covered so that they're not paying out of pocket for those things. Um, we actually recently developed a clinic at UCLA um, through our autism center, through the Department of Psychiatry, called the Developmental Neurogenetics Clinic. And the goal of this clinic is to actually provide one multidisciplinary place for families whose children have been diagnosed with a genetic condition through that testing and who also have autism, right? And we see them with, we see the children with genetics, psychiatry, neurology, psychology. We have intervention experts in that clinic. And we provide the family with guidance with regards to what that genetic condition might mean. But we also tie them straight into research. So sometimes we have opportunities for our whole goal is clinical trials, but also opportunities for things like studies where we can start understanding what the different genetic changes mean in the child's brain or in brain development. We can start thinking about whether there are specific patterns of behavior or development that might be more specific to that genetic condition, right? Because that helps us target treatments a bit better. Okay, so the other uh, in a set of insights that we've gained from learning about autism genetics is that we can start examining what these genes actually do um, to brain development, right? So what is the implication of these genetic changes? And what we have learned, and this is summarizing a huge literature in a couple of slides, is that these genes in autism impact basic brain functions. They impact the, things like protein synthesis, the activity of neurons, the way neurons or nerve cells actually talk to each other, the way brain circuits connect with each other. We also know that these genes impact brain development very early, often before birth. So these are processes that are starting at a very, very, very early stage of development, which is another reason why I kind of emphasize that it's unlikely that specific uh, events, such as vaccines that occur in the second year of life, are causing autism. I will say that when I show these data, I will be asked sometimes by parents, well, if it's starting so early, then what's, what's the you know, value of intervention? How are we going to change this process if this is starting so early? And what I will say is that brain development is incredibly dynamic, right? The brain is changing all the time. There's development occurring, and development is programmed not just by genetics. It's also influenced by environment and the input that infants get. And so we really believe that we can modify brain development based on experience. Of course, the earlier we intervene, the better. That's been shown in many studies across different conditions and even in typical development. So we would like to intervene as early as possible. So this is not to say that we cannot change trajectories, but it does suggest that we can maybe start identifying risk even earlier than when we're diagnosing. And I think that's a really important point here. Uh, Dan Geschwind, who runs our Autism Center and is a renowned uh, researcher in autism genetics, wrote this paper now 10 years ago, actually, but there was a, he, he coined this term that autism is a developmental disconnection. And I think that's a really nice way to think about the neurobiology of autism. It's that connections in the brain are not quite forming in a typical pattern. And this is occurring early, but again, continues to occur. And we do believe that there's ways to modify some of those trajectories with intervention. So based on what I told you about the neurobiology, I think this slide is really important because it's, it's really the kind of scientific and even clinical premise of all the work that we, much of the work that we do at UCLA and much of the work that we do in my research program in particular, which is focused on biomarkers. And it's that based on what we know about brain development, we really believe that we should be able to study patterns of not just atypical or delayed behavior, but also brain development before autism is diagnosed. We also believe that we should be able to measure, measure brain patterns that precede or underlie the behaviors that we see in autism. We believe we should be able to identify brain patterns that reflect specific genetic causes, which you can imagine would help us start parsing some of the heterogeneity or variability we see in autism. And ultimately, what's the goal of all this? It's not just academic. We hope that these studies would help us guide developmentally informed, biologically based targeted treatments with outcome measures, right, based on both behavior and brain pattern. So this 
is the premise underlying much of the research being done across really the world, but also at UCLA, in autism biomarkers. I'm going to show you one, two slides as an example of, of this first point, which is that we believe we can study patterns early in development. Because you might ask, well, how do we, how do we measure these things in babies, and who do we even study? Do we study the whole population, which would be hard, especially in LA, given that it's impossible to drive five miles without spending an hour. So how do we study, how do we study these infants? Uh, and, and before I get to that, I'll just mention that based on actually really this premise, right, that we should be able to study patterns of atypical behavior, there have been many studies around the country and world that have studied high-risk infants, right? And, and again, you might ask, how do you study a high-risk infant? You can study the general population, but the other way is based on our knowledge of the heritability of autism, which is that if we know that a sibling of a child with autism is at heightened risk for developing autism, then we can study them from birth, right? Because we know that they are at higher risk from the get-go, from, from birth. Based on that knowledge, there have been many studies that, that, that are unified by this theme of studying these baby siblings. And there's a consortium called the Baby Sibs Research Consortium that's been studying these high-risk infants for about two decades. And actually, much of that work was started by Marion Sigmund here at UCLA. And what's been found from a behavioral standpoint from those studies is that there are evidence of behavioral signs between ages one and three. And you might imagine where those signs are coming from. It's, a, it's quite a bit of social communication, reduced social attention and communication, some evidence of repetitive behaviors, delayed motor development. But what's been shown behaviorally is that there are no reliable markers for autism under the age of 12 months. Right, and that has been, again, a large driving force for our work in biomarkers because we believe we should be able to measure some differences in the first year. So how do we measure the brain in the first year of life, right? And there's two, there's two methods that we use here at UCLA that also are being used around the country. One is electroencephalography. These are two children who are representative of the kind of children that we see in our research program. We can actually, with just these easy, easy to apply nets, we can record brain activity in real time. So what we're doing is we're, we're examining the, uh, the brain waves or the oscillations that are reflective of the firing of neurons or nerve cells. And what we can do with EEG is measure not just brain activity, meaning how much of certain EEG frequencies, for instance, are we seeing, but we can also measure things like connectivity. How are brain circuits connected? Are there differences in patterns of connectivity in these infants at high risk? Do they predict more delayed development or even an autism diagnosis? And if we believe that this measure, which we do, um, relates to some of the neurobiological underpinnings, like the disruption in, in connections, then we believe we should be able to measure these things early on. We also can actually examine children with structural imaging, with an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. If any of you have had an MRI, you know that you have to stay very still and it feels a little claustrophobic. So what we do with babies is we wait till they're sleeping and we swaddle them up and we actually can examine their brain structure and function in that way. And so we actually do study, and this is with work uh, with a colleague, Morella DiPretto at UCLA, we can study brain activity at six weeks of age all the way up through uh, when they're old enough to start moving around quite a bit, then it gets a little bit harder. So we have a study at UCLA called the UCLA Infant Sibling Study. So we're studying these babies. And what we're doing in the study is really examining connectivity. And we're examining MRI at six and nine months and EEG at multiple time points in the first year. This is hard work because babies, you know, have different schedules and there's a lot of work that the parents have to do to bring them in to do this. But they're very committed because our goal is to identify risk markers so that we can start targeting treatments earlier. And I'm just going to show you one slide of an example of the kind of data that we gather. This is from EEG. And what we're examining is how different parts of the brain are connecting. And we're specifically interested in how the right and the left sides connect. And what you'll see here, without even providing you numbers, is that the red line are infants who go on to show concerns on clinical testing. So it's not just our high-risk group. So we're studying high-risk infants, and we're comparing them to low-risk infants. And then at the end of the study, we actually perform clinical testing to identify any behavioral delays or differences that we might see. Of course, anytime we see a delay, we give feedback to the family and start intervention. So the red line are children who, at 18 months, we're showing concerns for autism based on a tool called the ADOS. And the blue line are children who are not showing concerns. 
And what you'll see here is at six months of age, we're seeing big differences in patterns of connectivity in the infants who go on to show concerns for autism. So again, I could show you 20 more slides of data like this from MRI and EEG, but I just want to show you an example of this to say that we can measure these kinds of processes very early in development. And the goal here is not just to say, oh, this is quite interesting, we'll keep following them and then give them a diagnosis. It's to say, hey, we're concerned at six months based on some of these brain patterns. Let's start thinking about intervention strategies. OK, so my last few minutes, I'm going to talk about treatment. I'm going to wear my clinician hat as a child neurologist to give you some of this information because there are a lot of questions that I get, get asked about treatment for autism. And I often feel uh, badly because I don't always have answers. We don't have a gold standard perfect treatment for every child with autism. And that is our goal with all of our research. Our goal is to improve outcomes. So I kind of conceptualize the way we think about treatment targets in autism is this bullseye, where if you think the goal is the bullseye, precision medicine, right? We, wanna, we would like to treat the cause, and we'll talk about that at the end for a minute, but we'd like to treat the cause and completely eradicate all symptoms, right? We're not quite there yet, right? So then the, the second layer is to think about you know, which is slightly, slightly more targeted than thinking about all of autism, but is, can we treat some of the comorbidities, like, we, and we didn't talk about those too much today, but things like sleep issues or anxiety or irritability or ADHD, which could also improve functioning, right? And that is, is this sort of layer of the bullseye. And then the most broad layer is, can we actually treat the core symptoms of autism, right? The social communication, uh, delays or impairments or the repetitive behaviors and restricted interests. And this is an important slide as a take home point for what we know about intervention in autism, which is that for the core symptoms of autism, the mainstay gold standard of treatment is behavioral intervention. There have been many, many studies that have shown effectiveness of behavioral intervention for improving core symptoms. This is it. There's no medication for core symptoms of autism. That's an important take home point. Within this though, I think it's important to kind of disentangle what behavioral intervention means because we often uh, will use terms interchangeably without them really having the meaning that they should. So some of you may have heard of ABA or applied behavior analysis. ABA is an umbrella term for most treatments that are used for children with autism. ABA, the goal of it is simply to shape and reinforce new behaviors and to reduce undesirable ones. So you could imagine that a child with autism who might have many repetitive behaviors, some of the goals of their ABA will be focused on reducing repetitive behaviors. Another child may have more challenges with eye contact or with specific types of interactive play, and their ABA might be more focused on that. Okay, so it's really focused on improving all domains of functioning, but it's really targeting behaviors. Now within the umbrella of ABA are many different types of interventions that different children will use and try. I like to think of them, and this is barred largely by a colleague named Amanda Gulstrud who runs our clinical program here, this continuum of these interventions being adult-led all the way to being more child-led, meaning adult-led discrete trial is the most common one, is one where the adult is really directing the child's behavior and really teaching them specific tools or tasks based on the goals. Whereas the very child-led interventions, if you watched it without a trained eye, you would think the child and the interventions were just playing. And the child is really directing a lot of the play that's being done. I would highlight one in particular called JASPER, which was an intervention developed here at UCLA by Connie Cassery. It stands for Joint Attention Symbolic Play Engagement Regulation. And it's a play-based intervention that improves social communication skills and language in children with autism. Connie has done many, many clinical trials, randomized control trials, demonstrating effectiveness. But I, I bring up this sort of myth that often gets presented to me, which is that ABA is just this discrete trial. They often get interchanged. And I just want to emphasize that ABA is any of these sorts of strategies where we're trying to modify behavior. And there's no one-size-fits-all approach. So often, we will recommend different types of interventions based on the age of the child, the developmental needs of the child. Sometimes it ends up being a practical issue, unfortunately. So certain a child, a, a family's insurance might only cover certain types of interventions. And so we are sometimes left recommending interventions based on pragmatics. But there are ways to explore these different options, especially in Los Angeles, where there are many excellent providers throughout the city. 
and this is the other myth I will bring up, is that there is one, you know, you may be told that there's one type of intervention. Discrete trial is the only way to cure a child or improve a child's outcome with, with autism, and I will say that's not the case. We really do try to take it child by child based on their symptoms. Okay, so the other kind of, uh, so we talked about core, core symptoms. I'm going to go back for a second, right? So what about comorbidities, right? What are the kinds of treatments we think about for the comorbidities, and what are the comorbidities that we need to treat most actively? Insomnia is the biggest one. Insomnia, meaning just not enough sleep in whatever form that takes, is, occurs in up to 80% of children with autism. It's the number one complaint of my patients who see, come to see me in clinic. Usually the pattern is they have trouble falling asleep, they have multiple nighttime awakenings, and then they wake up early. So just not enough sleep. And that can be very debilitating, not just for the child, but for the family, for the parents who are up with their child. So there are actually recommended guidelines for managing sleep in children with autism. Autism Speaks has a very helpful autism to, uh, sleep toolkit which actually guides parents in behavioral strategies for improving sleep. And I won't go into the details just to guide you to that website. And every, anyone has access to that sleep toolkit. But they provide some basic tools like you know, helping parents establish a bedtime routine, to keeping on a certain schedule. They provide in the toolkit visual schedules for children so they know what sequence of events needs to happen before they need to go to sleep. Sometimes behavioral interventions alone are not enough, right? Parents try all that they can and it's just not enough to help their child sleep and that's when we move on to medications. And these are all off-label. These, these are not specifically FDA approved for insomnia in children and I have to highlight that. But I'm just going to show you the ones that have been studied in trials and it's really just two. It's actually really just one, one and a half kind of. So the main um, medication, which is really a neurohormone that our bodies make naturally, uh, that's been studied quite well in clinical trials is melatonin. So our bodies naturally make melatonin and our brains see a surge of melatonin at night when it's time to sleep, often when the brain sees a switch from light to dark. And that surge of melatonin is one of the cues that tells our brain that it's time to go to sleep. And there's some science, some evidence to suggest that there may be some disruption in not just synthesis of melatonin, but even the um, receptors that see melatonin in some children with autism. So melatonin has been very well studied for sleep. I have a, one cautionary tale about melatonin is that there are many flavors of melatonin that are available in the grocery store. This is not a prescribed medication, it's really a supplement. And I just highlight this, this is actually borrowed from a friend of mine from Boston Children's who's a sleep specialist. I thought it was particularly telling. So you have the same company here, for example, that makes melatonin. This one is three milligrams extra strength, and this one is five milligrams, not extra strength, right? So that it, it, it sort of leads us to realize that there's some variability in how these things are formulated. And my suggestion to patients is, if you find a brand that you like, stick to it and don't switch. And bring the bottle in to see, show your provider when you first come to the clinic visit. The other big cautionary detail about melatonin is that it needs to be dosed appropriately. I often have patients come to me taking half a milligram or one milligram. The studies in melatonin have actually examined the effects of 10 to 15 milligrams of melatonin. So I just emphasize that it's important to dose it properly, and this is something that you should talk to your physician about. But important to sort of realize that. The other medication that's been studied quite well is clonidine. And what I'll say about these two meds is that melatonin has been more consistently shown to help with sleep onset. It helps kids fall asleep. Doesn't always keep them asleep through the night. Clonidine has been more uh, consistently shown to help with sleep, uh, nighttime awakenings, I should say. So it reduces the number of nighttime awakenings. Sometimes help, helps kids fall asleep, or stay asleep. So I sometimes will actually dose both of them together. Couple more slides on treatment. So complementary and alternative treatments. This is actually in part for the providers who might be watching this, which is that parents are using many alternative modes of treatment. And some examples include alternative medical systems, like even hyperbaric oxygen or chelation, some biologically based therapies like supplements and vitamins, and, you know, and then other things like body-based therapies like massage, but these two are the big ones, right? The alternative medical systems and biologically based therapies. And really the key here is that we as providers need to be asking about these. It's not sufficient to ask just about what medications a child is using because often the parent might say, I'm not using any medications, but then when we ask about supplements or any other forms of intervention or treatment, a list comes out. 
And I think this is important because we need to be aware of these. Some of these might be perfectly safe, but some of them may have been shown to actually not be safe or could interact with some of the medications we're providing or prescribing. So it's very, very important that we ask about these. I'll mention one sort of uh, one, one category of these, of, of these alternative sort of treatments, which is the diets and supplements. So the gluten-free, casein-free diet is often used or is a choice that families make for their children. And I'll just say that there are a couple of studies. There's two randomized controlled trials. None of them have shown a significant effect on autism symptomatology. What has been described in some cases is that children who take the gluten-free, casein-free diet or use that diet may have a reduction in some of their aggression or overt uh, behaviors. It might calm them a bit. And my theory, truthfully, on that is that it's probably in many children reducing the amount of sugar they're actually intaking and providing them with possibly a slightly healthier diet. But it can be an issue in children who have food intolerances or nutritional deficiencies because sometimes the food doesn't, might not taste as good to a child or it might restrict their intake even more. So we have to be careful about the, these diets and ensure that children are still receiving the nutrition that they need. Probiotics are another supplement that's actually often used by families. I'd say about half of my patients take a probiotic. This is based, the probiotics are based on an understanding that there, there may be an imbalance in our gut's bacteria, in the, guts, in the bacteria in the gut of children with autism. So if so, using a probiotic, which is sort of the good bacteria for the gut, might help improve that balance. That's really the basic premise behind probiotics. There have not been any clinical trials yet demonstrating effectiveness, and that's what I'll emphasize. It hasn't shown to be harmful, so I don't discourage it as long as parents are very clear that we do not have evidence to support that it actually helps with autism symptoms. And I highlight this here, this is just, I literally pulled this just from Google, which is that they're not cheap. And that is a possible risk, if you will. You know, we think about health risks and benefits of treatment, but we have to think about the costs of these types of alternative treatments when that money could be channeled towards behavioral interventions that we think could improve some core symptoms. Okay, and then I'm gonna end with this thought, which is that from the standpoint of treatment, as I mentioned, the bullseye is the gold standard, right? It's what we're really trying to achieve is, is getting to a place of, as we think of it, precision medicine. And we, there are some movements towards that. So if you think about in autism that there are identified etiologies, like certain genetic variations that we know are causing autism, if we can start mapping specific uh, aberrations or changes in brain function based on our knowledge of etiology, and we can start identifying more targeted symptoms within the spectrum. So you have a child with a specific genetic condition, and we do quite a bit of research in this in, in our center, we might start not only understanding brain function, but also identifying specific symptoms of autism that are more characteristic of that genetic cause. We then can use that information to think about treatment targets, right? And those treatment targets, the treatment is not simply going to target those more specific behavioral symptoms, but our goal is that that treatment will target the process that's occurring in the brain. And that ultimately should lead to improve outcomes, improved outcomes. And this basic schematic is really what drives much of the research that we do at UCLA. And I do think that we are on the cusp of more targeted treatments for uh, at least subgroups of children within the autism spectrum. I'll also just highlight, and this is actually based on this bubble here, that you may imagine that for us to start really mapping differences in brain function based on all the different types of autisms, we need a big consortium to do this kind of work. You need big sample sizes. And the National Institutes of Health have recently funded a very large effort in identifying biomarkers of autism. We are one of the five sites, so it's Yale, Harvard, Duke, University of Washington, and UCLA. And this is a study of using EEG, eye tracking, and behavioral assessments to really understand subtypes based on brain function in children with autism. And that study is ongoing. We just started this year. So I'll end with just some take home points. First, as I mentioned, autism is a behavioral diagnosis. It's based on signs and symptoms. It is not based on cause, nor is it based on a blood test or any other kind of test that we would do outside of doing testing on behavior. 
I mentioned it's not based on etiology. And so therefore, as you can imagine, with all the different behaviors that we're talking about, there's considerable heterogeneity or variability in presentation, which makes it hard, challenging as a clinician and as a parent. I understand that it's hard to give perfect guidance on prognosis or treatments, but we're getting there. Thus far, behavioral intervention for core deficits and medications for comorbidities have been the mainstay of treatment. Um, and I would say, however, tremendous advances in genetics have led to focus, a focus on etiology-based diagnosis, which we hope will then guide targeted treatments, which again is the goal of what we call precision medicine. So I've provided you here with some contact very dim, but some contact websites for our Autism Center where we have clinical services and we also provide many opportunities for research from early, early infancy all the way through adulthood. And I will end, should I go into this one? There, okay, so I think I have some questions and I will scan these right now. So, Okay, oh, these are great questions. So the first question is, when should a child with autism undergo an EEG or MRI? Fantastic question, because I mentioned earlier that the only gold standard across the board assessment that a child with autism should undergo is genetic testing. So an EEG, which is again a study of brain waves, is clinically speaking an assessment that we use to characterize spells that are concerning for seizures. And I didn't talk about it here today, but about 15% of children with autism do develop seizures or have epilepsy. So that's a much higher risk than the general population. So if a child has clear evidence of seizures, they should undergo an EEG. Or if a child's having spells that are concerning and we're not clear what they are, then that is actually an indication to undergo an EEG. Oftentimes patients come to see me in clinic for exactly that reason. They're having new spells where they seem like they're staring or unresponsive, and the family or the teachers are not sure what exactly that is. Those are the kinds of situations where I will actually obtain an EEG to see if we can capture that spell to determine whether it is a seizure. The reason that's important is that if a child's having seizures, we need to be aggressive about treating that because that can actually help developmentally as well. An MRI, which is a test of brain structure, is really only indicated if there's a clear abnormality on their neurologic examination, meaning there's a weakness on one side or something, or their gait is very abnormal or different, something that really makes us worried about some pathology in the brain. The other times we'll obtain MRIs are if a child has a known genetic syndrome that is associated with any kind of uh, you know, changes in the brain structure will obtain an MRI. Those are the two main reasons that we would obtain an MRI in the setting of autism. So the next question is, I have three kids with autism and they've never been seen by a neurologist. They've just been seen by their pediatrician. How can I start looking for a neurologist that specializes in autism? Are the visits covered by insurance? Good question. We have two at UCLA, myself, and Dr. Rajutha Bhatt, who is uh, trained here, and she's also a developmental behavioral child neurologist. So we do see children with autism in our clinic. Our clinic is called the Child and Adult Neurodevelopmental Clinic, and we see patients every Thursday afternoon, and we do take almost all insurances. There are many other child neurologists in Los Angeles who see children with autism. Cedar sinai has a, has a great program. CHLA has child neurologists who will see children with autism. The, I think the question becomes who needs to see a neurologist. I didn't have that slide. I wish I had that slide here. We are generally happy to see any child once to give guidance if that is helpful. But if you want to minimize the number of doctors your child is seeing, I would say that the indications for seeing a neurologist are if there is a concern about a genetic syndrome or even identified genetic syndrome, if there is a concern for seizures and there needs to be a further workup with an EEG, if there's a concern about some abnormality on neurologic examination or significant motor problems or delays, then a neurologist can be helpful. Those are really the main indications to be referred to a neurologist. But as I said, we are happy to see any child wants for a consultation, and then we can help guide you further on other specialties. But we try to avoid having you have to see many, many doctors because it gets challenging to have to do that. Okay, so this is a fantastic question. There are so many treatment options available when I search the internet. How do I know what's safe or effective? Great question, and the answer is it's very hard. And I actually think that as a medical community, we need to do a better job of messaging what we know what we know is safe, what we know is effective, what we know has been studied in clinical trials because unfortunately, one hundredth of what you will see on the internet has actually been studied. 
So my suggestion to you is if you're considering any new intervention or treatment, write it down and before you do anything, present it to your physician. That could be your pediatrician, it could be a specialist like a child psychiatrist or a neurologist, it could be your intervention expert as just a first pass. But show it to someone, run it by someone who is a healthcare professional so that they can give you their thoughts. And you might go to three different physicians and receive three different answers. That may happen sometimes, but at least we can tell you what we know to be shown to be effective or safe. My other plea to patients is that you, when you come to a physician's visit, bring the list of everything you're taking and please be upfront about that. Our goal is to make it a safe environment where we can actually per support you and help you because our goal ultimately is to help your child make gains and get better, right? We really want to, we are there to help, but it's hard to help if we don't know everything that you're taking. So please bring that and we can think about whether there might be interactions, whether there are certain supplements that are perfectly safe and benign and might be worth trying, whereas other ones we think might be not only unsafe but also incredibly expensive. And maybe those resources could be used towards other interventions that we think might be more helpful. So the next question is also a good one. What should I do if I'm worried about my infant having developmental delays or even early signs of autism? Nowadays, based on the CDC recommendations, every pediatrician does a, should perform a, very, a good developmental screen at every age in the first year of life. Anytime there are concerns, the recommendation is that a child be referred to early intervention services. You as a parent can go directly to regional center and early intervention to express your concerns. And the regional center themselves will perform an evaluation and then provide services accordingly. So you as a parent know your child best and if you're concerned, it's very important to bring it up not only with your healthcare provider, but again, also you can access early intervention services yourself. And then another, another, the last question, again, also excellent question, is what are some of the earliest behavioral signs of autism? So from a clinical standpoint, the earliest signs, again, and you may not be surprised, are based on some of the core symptoms we see in autism. It's social communication, eye contact, pointing, gesturing with, with words or with even sounds. Those are some of the earliest signs. So really measures of social attention and, and attending to others in a social environment. Other signs that actually, there's a public paper published very recently that actually found that motor delays very early in infancy by six months of age also are somewhat predictive of developmental delay and possibly autism. So in, our, in these infant sibling studies, some motor delays have been found in the first year of life. Um, language is another domain that we see delayed in children who develop autism. The tricky thing about language is, as parents who are listening will know, in the first year of life, most language is babbling and cooing and maybe turning to name, those sorts of things. There's not a lot of words that are being said in the first year. So sometimes we will see delays even in babbling and cooing and those sorts of things, but it's usually the nonverbal communication where we're seeing the delays. One more, okay. Uh, what research is available for older children who've already been diagnosed or have complex comorbid conditions? Great question. There are many studies, so I just highlighted our baby work, but we have many studies in our autism center across a lifespan. We don't have a, a specific study for adults now, but we're hoping that will change with some time. Uh, if you go to our, oh, I don't have the clicker anymore. If you go to our, our autism center website, the center is called CART, C-A-R-T. On the website, what we've done is we've listed all the studies available by age. So the bio, my biomarkers consortium study that I mentioned, that study is for children ages six to 11. So if you have a school age child, that's a fantastic study and we see children across the entire spectrum. Our goal is to see children across the spectrum with all sorts of different, uh, different etiologies and conditions. We also have another study that's focused on children who have autism and intellectual disability, so cognitive impairment. And that actually spans a much wider age range. And that is another study that we're doing at UCLA. We have a couple of intervention studies that are being done for older children. Connie Cassery, who I mentioned, who developed Jasper, 
has many studies focused on minimally verbal children with autism. And she has studies that are in the schools as well as at UCLA testing certain intervention strategies to improve language. And some of those studies are for school-aged children as well. And then lastly, I'll say we have a network study that is multiple sites that's focused on gender differences in autism, examining whether autism looks different in girls compared to boys. That study also is for school-age children, so another study for older children. I think that is it. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I took more than half an hour, but the questions were fantastic. And uh, again, I hope you visit our uh, center and get involved with our research in clinical care because again, our really our goal is to optimize outcome in children of all ages with autism. Thank you.